Okay, so uh, tonight's topic is super interesting. Um, the big question in fertility uh, has always been how much does your body mass index impact your fertility success rates? And we've known for a long time that if you have a higher BMI, it appears to be detrimental. So those women who are struggling with a higher BMI tend to have uh, more problems in terms of getting more eggs, they have problems finishing cycles, there's a higher cycle cancellation rate, uh, they don't make as many embryos, they certainly don't make as many blastocysts, and there's fairly good evidence that even the implantation rates are lower. So we definitely have been working a long time on helping our patients through this. Here at our center, we have a nutritionist, we have an addiction specialist, um, we really encourage our patients to try and stay as fit and as healthy as possible. Uh, for all of our PCO women who struggle with this frequently, we talk a lot about what's necessary. Uh, there's a multi-pronged approach when you have PCOS and part of it is your lifestyle management. So it's six meals a day and definitely exercise where you're building muscle. So not just kind of get on a treadmill because that's actually not helpful. You want to be doing something where you're building muscle. So many of you have heard me talk about HIIT training, high intensity interval training. Um, I've done Focus T25. I think that's a great exercise program, but pretty much anything you do where you're building muscle will help. And we've encouraged women uh, all through this time to engage in weight loss or weight reduction because there is good data that demonstrates that if you reduce your weight even 5 to 10 pounds um, or 5 to 10 percent which is even more important that you will see an improvement in multiple factors including ovulation, uh, regular menstruation, making more embryos, making more eggs and implantation as well. So there was a really interesting study which came out of a journal I wasn't really anticipating it to come out of, but I was scanning through the various journals last uh, week and I thought this was a great study to bring to your attention and really important for me as well. So this is from the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Now the AJOG journal is not the one we turn to for fertility things. That's usually fertility and sterility or human reproduction, which is the European one. And so this was a really interesting uh, finding because it's in a journal that it wasn't really expected to, to be in. So what they did was they used the data from something called SART, and SART is the Society of Assisted Reproductive Technology in the US. And if you are in a US fertility center, they basically make you sign up to be part of SART. And when you're part of SART, you actually have to report to SART every year with your results. We have to do it here in Canada, and in Canada it's called CARTR, C-A-R-T-R, -R, and in America it's called SART. So these folks wanted to analyze what the impact of age was on your fertility outcomes, what the impact of BMI was on your fertility outcomes, and then they wanted to see if there was an intersection between the two where maybe it wasn't as important to be younger or older or it wasn't as important to be heavier or lighter. So uh, kind of an interesting study because no one's actually looked at it in that way before. Everybody's always looked at body mass index, but they haven't broken it down by age or looked for sort of a, a cut point where you can say, hey, it's not as important anymore. So uh, because they're using SART data, they had access to a huge database. So they went all the way from 2014 um, to 2015 and they extracted data on 51,959 cycles. So huge study, giant numbers. And out of those 50,711 of the cycles resulted in an intention at least for a fresh embryo transfer. So they were focusing on the fresh, not on the frozen. And just to give you some background info, when they looked overall at the outcome from those cycles, it's pretty reasonable. The clinical live birth rate was 41.2% after they included subsequent frozen embryo transfers and the initial fresh embryo transfer. And so that's a pretty robust finding considering they're putting in everybody. So regardless of whether they're younger, older, lighter, normal, heavier, everybody's included in this data set. So what we found in general in the study is important to let you guys know about. And I, I wanna kind of break down how they, how they conducted it. So they took the data and they stratified it by age and by body mass index. So the age was less than 30, 30 to 34, 35 to 37, 38 to 39, 
uh, sorry, 38 to 40, 41 to 42, and then greater than 42. Body mass index they defined as underweight, which was less than 18.5. Normal weight, which is between 18.5 and 24.9. Overweight, which is between 26 and 30, 29.9, sorry, 25 and, and 29.9. And then class one obesity, which is 30 to 34.9. Class two obesity, which is 35 to 39.9. Class three obesity, which is 40 to 44.9. And then they had two other categories, which are not normally in the literature, but they called their uh, second highest one morbid obesity, which was 45 to 49.9, and then super obesity, which is when your BMI is greater than 50. Now, just a message for everybody out there, in Canada, we can't do anyone over the age of 40 because you actually need to have a general anesthetic machine to provide care for that. Um, and you can't do it out of a hospital. It has to be done in a hospital setting. So that is not something we would experience here, but the data is still really important for you guys to know about. So overall, what did they find? Well, they found that the majority of the women, about 27,000, were either uh, normal weight or just slightly overweight. And about half were in the class one, class two obesity, with a lot less in the class three and then morbid and super obesity categories. Any women that were in any of the obese categories tended to have fewer eggs retrieved. They had fewer embryos created, normally fertilized eggs and they had uh, fewer blastocysts when their BMI was over 40. Um, so that's really important. The number of embryo transfers did not differ based on what their body mass index was. So they have this really interesting uh, chart where they looked at what the, um, the odds ratios were or the risk was for live birth based on your weight status. So this is just based on weight. They are not factoring in um, the age categories, but they did factor in age and they also factored in other things like smoking, um, uh, previous history, uh, the age is put in as a linear determinant, so they're factoring it in to some extent, but not as groupings. And so when they adjusted for that, they showed that if you were slightly overweight, you had a 4% decrease in your success for live birth. If you were in the class one obesity, so 30 to 34.9, you were a 6% decrease in your success. If you're in class two obesity, so 35 to 39.9, it's a 15% reduction in your success. And these are all very highly significant. It goes up to 24% when your BMI is over 40 to 27% when your BMI is between 45 and 49. And for the few women that were in that super obese category where their BMI is over 50, it was a 59% decrease in success. The other thing that they noted that's really important is that their miscarriage rates were higher. So they have a chart um, looking at the miscarriage rates and when they examined the miscarriage rates, they also found a, a very similar sort of um, finding where the, the miscarriage rates were actually higher. So when you look at those numbers, um, they show that it's 12% higher when you are 25 to 29, so again, just overweight. It's 19% higher when you're in class one obesity, 41% higher class two obesity, 72% higher when you're in class three obesity. And then it actually dropped off in the higher categories, so it was 50% and then 42%, but again, the numbers are really small in those categories. So they definitely demonstrated that the body mass index in this huge study has a very significant uh, impact. They're saying there's no audio on YouTube. Huh, I don't know why. Um, I just saw that there. Uh, sorry for the no audio on YouTube. We will figure that out. I can't hear you. Hmm. Volume? Is your mic on maybe? Or this guy here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, supposedly it's working. I'm not sure why we're not getting it there, guys. Uh, you'll have to switch to Instagram, uh, which is rahivictory.md or uh, Facebook. Um, not sure why it's not uh, working. Um, okay, so back to the issues at hand. 
So uh, when they broke this down by BMI, it definitely has a very significant impact. Miscarriage rates are much higher and your success rates are definitely lower. So that can be a significant factor. When they broke it down by age, uh, similar kinds of findings, but much, much more significant. So if you were between 30 to 34 years of age compared to women that are less than 30, you had a 9% decrease in success. When you were 35 to 37, you had a 21% decrease in success. When you're 38 to 40, you had a 47% decrease in success. 41 to 42 is a 72% decrease in success. And then when you're over 42, it's a 92% decrease in success. So very, very significant. The neat thing with all this is they then compiled the table, which you can't really see, but here it is, super complicated. And what they did was they stratified by age and then they stratified by your body mass index. And the interesting thing here is that if you look at the data, and it's too complicated as I showed you from that table to kind of uh, spell it out for you guys, but it basically shows that after the age of 38, it looks like your body mass index actually has less of an impact. Now that's probably because the success rates are drastically decreasing, like I showed you just earlier a moment ago, age has such a huge impact that you know, you're know you looking at a 50% decrease by the time you're in that 38 to 40 range, and then even more when you're in the 41, 42. So because the success rates are so much lower, it's looking very much like the body mass index in that age does not play as much of a role. So once you go over 40, we actually see quite a substantial difference where the numbers are kind of all around the same. So if for a 40 year old woman, if her uh, body mass index was normal, she had a 20% success rate. If she was slightly overweight, it was 19%. If she was class one obesity, it was 21% and so on. So the lowest numbers um, definitely around body mass index 40 to 44.9 but it's still only 12%, which is down for sure compared to the 20% for the normal weight, but not enough to be making a huge difference. So overall, it looks like that 38, 39 age category has a significant impact on how you do with your uh, success rate in terms of your body mass index. What does this mean for us? Well, they actually spell it out and it's really interesting. So I'll read what they said because I think they've phrased it best. For some age and BMI combinations, taking time to achieve a lower BMI before IVF may be beneficial. For example, a 31-year-old woman with class 3 obesity was shown to have a live birth rate of 40%, whereas a 33-year-old woman with class 1 obesity had a live birth rate of 54%. So if it takes you two years from 31 to 33 to get your BMI lower, you're still gonna get a higher success rate than you would have had you gone into IVF when you're still younger, but your BMI is higher. So for those patients, it's important. However, for others, taking time to lose weight may be detrimental. A 39-year-old woman with class three obesity has a live birth rate of 23%, Whereas a 41 year old woman with class one obesity um, had a clinical live birth rate of 12%. Given that it takes time to achieve a lower BMI, a 39 year old woman with overweight or obesity would potentially be compromising her likelihood of success with IVF as she would be older at cycle start if she delayed fertility treatment for one to two years. So the outcome of this study is really kind of very, very critical for us as fertility specialists because what it's telling me is once I'm getting to that 39 to 40 range, if my patient's BMI is higher, then we actually need to factor in the element that the patient may not benefit from losing weight. Now, certainly if you can do it in a short period of time, within six months or something like that, which is difficult, then yes, it will definitely help you. But if it's gonna take more than six months to achieve that, then we don't think it's a reasonable thing to do and you should actually probably be going ahead with your IVF. So factor fiction, is age more important than body mass index or is body mass index more important than age? Age is actually more important than your body mass index once you're over the age of 39, but before 39, it's actually your body mass index which appears to be more important. So for the younger women, taking that extra time does look beneficial and for older women, it does not.
So that was the factor fiction for tonight. It's kind of a game changer for us because we've always told patients that to optimize their health, they do need to lose weight. But certainly for years now, I've even without this study told patients that if they were in their 40s, that it was imperative that we got moving. So we didn't always make them lose the weight unless it looked like it was dangerous or risky. There are still risk factors up there. So once your BMI is up into the high 35 and above 40s, um, there are definitely much, much higher risks of complications in the pregnancy. And we need you guys to know about that. So it's important, really critical for you guys to make sure that you are taking care of yourselves because we don't want to run into problems. The one advantage of IVF, we can make your embryos, make you lose the weight, keep the embryos frozen and transfer them in after with a frozen embryo transfer, which is a, a great option as well.